We worship you, my Father. God, we just humble ourselves before the almighty hand of God and the glory that you are, acknowledging that you alone, you alone, God, you alone have redeemed us, translated us, released us, freed us. You alone bought us back from every claim against us. You alone removed us and translated us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the Son of God. You alone washed us from sin and paid for all so that our life would manifest yours. God, we bless you. God, we just bless you. Now tonight, this morning, I want you to just release yourself from anything that would distract you. If there's been an effect on your life, the natural circumstance, there's been something come back up against your finance, your body, your mind, just cast it over on the Lord. Release yourself completely. I believe we're in an atmosphere that God has ordained to speak to his children, to manifest himself through us, to both speak and perform what he has declared. God, we set ourselves in one accord with you that nothing is able to withstand the nature of your grace through us. So God would just cast every care, every distraction, all thought, all issue over unto you. And we thank you, Lord, for grace that prevails and communion and intimacy with you, Father, that avails. We honor you, my God. We bless you, Lord. Now just pray in your spirit for a few moments, identifying him, identifying his person, identifying his presence, identifying the nature through whom you live. For in him you live, you move, and you have your being. God, you've given to us access that we can experience life and that more abundantly. God, we can experience grace that flows through us and imputes to us the very nature of your way in which you commune with us. Holy Spirit of God, we magnify you. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, my God. We bless you. Now, I want the, back in, in the, the TV world there, if they could take Colossians 4.2 and put it up on the screen, please. 4.2 and 4.3. And I want you to pray a very specific prayer this morning. It says, continue in prayer and watch in the same, in that prayer life, with thanksgiving. So you're praying for people and you're aware of what could interfere and you're thankful for what God's given to you. And in verse 2, it says, and with all, pray also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I'm an ambassador in bonds. So I want you to pray for me that the Door of utterance, God's voice will unveil today. And verse 4 is critical. That I might make it what? Manifest. Manifest, as I ought to speak. There's a responsibility in the unveiling of the nature of Christ for manifestation. It's not good enough to know something. You must experience it. God has designed us to have manifestation of his nature, not just belief in it. So when Paul says, he says, I want you to pray for us that God would give to us a door of utterance so we make, might make known the mystery of the gospels we ought to speak. And that I might make it what? Now that's a, that's a critical understanding because the tandem, if, if you think about it, the, the communion connection that's necessary for God to manifest himself for God to perform his word, for God to unveil his nature, requires in us a manifestation. But Paul didn't say that God would manifest it. He said that I might make it manifest. Remember when Peter walked up to the man at the gate, he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It's what he had. It's what the nature is in us that is able to be communicated and unveiled in our experience. So go ahead and pray for me right now. Not only that a door of utterance would be opened, but that I might also make it manifest as I ought to speak. 
The God who has given to us the hearing ear of the voice of the living God, we hear and speak as the tongue of a ready writer, the word that is inscribed upon our hearts and our minds. We speak as an oracle of the living God, as one through whom you, God, are speaking, and that you would open that door of us hearing you as I ought to speak, make it manifest. God, what you say that is brought from the obscure to the seen, it's brought from the invisible to the visible, it's brought from the non-detectable to the knowing and experiential. Our heart cry, God, is not that we would just know about you, but the intimacy of exchange of life that you've given through Christ Jesus. The power of life in resurrection that is ours to be experienced, God, our heart and our passion, our heart cry, establishes on the simple reality that God will ask you, open your words in us, speak through us, and make manifest through us. As God, we ought to speak and ought to act and demonstrate your life. We yield to you. God, we yield to you for you to manifest for you to open prison doors, for you to give us the voice, the words that will proclaim liberty to the captives, that the word of God will be so accurate it'll set at liberty them that are bound. It'll go into atmospheres of oppression and liberate because you didn't give us a spirit of bondage again to fear, but a spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So just lift up your hands to God and thank God He's fathered you. That He's given to you experience in His life to manifest Himself. That the living utterances of the living God have experience and manifestation to them, not simply belief. God, our heart cry is set on one single course. That this life, which is ours, is exposed, is seen, is unveiled. And God, we just bow our life. We bow our hearts. We magnify you. God, that we can make manifest. God, make manifest. Take the cover off, disclose, reveal, perform. Give us embrace of grace that transforms us from all disgrace. God, that moves us from human attentiveness to God's involvement. God, we believe you. That in these days and hours ahead in our life, we are the extension of your life. We're the habitation of your spirit. We are the expression of your life in this earth. And God, you manifest. As you have said in your word, you watch over your word to perform it. And we honor you in Jesus' name. I want you to go ahead and greet somebody and say, so that God would manifest. Just go ahead, look him in the eye and say, so God would manifest. So God would manifest. God would manifest. Not so we get what we're looking for, but so that God would manifest. Manifest. Now, if God manifests, how many think things are changed? I mean, I don't know what you experience, but my experience is in any area God manifests, nothing is the same. I may look at it at one moment in time and it is one dimension of function, but when God touches, God manifests, it doesn't matter how I see it, it's a manifestation of God that's resulted. And today we're going to deal with the access granted us through his life because we live in him and he through us we're in a time where on wednesday nights i'm teaching a series that's called access granted that we have access to such a supernatural engagement with god and everything that obstructs what god has purposed to manifest in our life, we have access to see everything that obstructs and deters what God has said in action. And so as we take a journey into this, as we go into Wednesday night, 
It's an experience of manifestation. Last Wednesday night, we talked about the spirit of offense, that it was a primary objective of the enemy to turn the hearts of people for how it affects them. Even walking with Jesus. When Jesus said to Peter, who do men say that I am? They said, well, some say you're Elijah, or some say you're John the Baptist, or one of the other prophets, Jeremiah. He said, but who do you say I am? And he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he says, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in the heavens, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in the heavens. And then immediately Jesus began to teach and to, to share with his disciples how he must be tormented and suffering under the hands of the Sanhedrin and under the leadership of the, of the Jewish temple in the day and find himself crucified and die and rise again the third day. And Peter turns and he says, no way. I, have, I, I know God is speaking to me. This is not going to happen to you. And with as great of resolve as Peter had, he couldn't see what God was speaking because the enemy had come to speak an objection to God's intent. You know, the enemy speaks an objection to God's plan in your life constantly. He comes immediately to steal the word that's sown in your heart. If it does get sown, you find yourself sidetracked by offenses. And if it does begin to take root, you find that the only thing that you're after is the lust of other things, the deceitfulness of riches, and the cares of this world. You interpret the gospel in the text of how does it benefit you. So the enemy knows how to twist the truth so it becomes a personal issue and how the outcome is it would benefit my life. Because Jesus said to Peter, he said, Thou art an offense unto me. For you savor not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. You're not seeking the interest and advantages that belong to the kingdom of God. But you are after what man is caring about. And Jesus said right after that, as he turned to his disciples, he says, if any man come unto me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Because there's an acknowledging that there is a vile strength of the enemy interpreting everything we experience as how am I going to experience this? What's in it for me? What is my benefit and advantage to trusting and believing? And Jesus simply said, that is a stronghold of the enemy that's been launched against the church. Have you ever seen the gospel twisted in such a way that the real use of it is how does God benefit my life? Have you ever seen the gospel twisted in that way? That's another spirit. It's not the spirit of God. So then what is the spirit of God? If what is commonly known as the gospel as to what do I get from God for what I want from God, is not the gospel of Jesus Christ, then what is? If we are to experience the life of God in a supernatural dynamic of him manifesting himself, and whatever he reveals is how he has intended to work, and not everything is interpreting in its appearance for your benefit. It's not about you just having a happy day, a better time, a joyful walk. It's about the life of Christ manifesting in you so you can handle anything and everything. Just like if you were a disciple walking with Jesus, you could go with him. And as Jesus is about to be crucified, he says to his disciples, he said, where I go, you know, and the way you know. I can imagine they're thinking, how do I know where you're going? He had spent three years after the revelation of Jesus sharing with them what he had to die to raise again to perform. And he said, the way you know. That's what we're going to talk about today that we have access into the way of God's functionality in our life granted to us. The access is given. We have access. Yeah, the enemy wants to interpret things as to what's in it for me. There is a spirit that wants to rise up and obstruct everything that God speaks. But, you know, that's not the issue. The issue is what has God done? What has he has set in motion? And what access do I have to embrace the nature and the life of God's given to me. Ephesians 3 verse 8 is a tremendous insight. As we go into the text here, take a look at it with me. It says, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And I love this verse in verse 9. It says, and to make. How do you know when you're made to do something, 
something has a greater influence on your life than your decision. It says, and make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hidden in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. He's saying, I'm going to take the secret that's in God, and I'm going to make you experience it. I have been ordained of God's grace to make men experience what God has risen his son to perform. And then he goes on. This is what the motivation is behind it. To the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be made known by the church the many-faceted wisdom of God. We spent time sharing how Jesus has made unto us what? Wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, his first manifestation is he has made to us wisdom. So I know, you know. As a matter of fact, the, the interesting key here is you know what God's doing. Every one of us does. Every one of us supernaturally has the nature of Christ manifest in us as wisdom. We know. And what we know, we are called by the nature of Christ to proclaim to the principalities and powers of the air what God has revealed. You say, well, why would I tell the enemy what God's doing? Because he's been telling you what he's not doing and what the enemy's been doing all your life. You've been hearing how God is not, what he doesn't, why he can't. Objections of the mind. Well, they have a stronger will. They have their own way. They can make their own decision. How many of you hear objections to God's supernatural intervention? We hear constantly in our mind the barrage of how God cannot because of the strength of human decision power, the man's will that is there. We constantly hear a barrage of thought. Well, that's what they've gone through. It's going to take a long time to get them out of it. Who said long time? When Jesus rose us from the power and translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God, it was an instantaneous transfer. We were shifted from one dynamic to another and called to reign in Christ. But so the enemy says, well, you know, it just takes time to be healed of hurts. You know, there's no scripture that says it takes time to be healed of hurts. It does, no scripture says time heals all things. What it says is you're anointed to bind up the brokenhearted. Set at liberty them that are bound. Give the beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It's an amazing awareness how much the mind hears the objections of the enemy. And we are the ordained instruments of God to turn to all that is speaking to obstruct and object and deter what God has set in motion and proclaim to the kingdom of darkness, this is what God is doing. To pronounce to it. So if I was going to ask you on a scale of 1 to 10 throughout the course of your normal day, how are you doing? Manifesting the wisdom of God and speaking to everything that obstructs and objects to the life of God in manifestation. He said that now, unto the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifested wisdom of God. It's our place to pronounce to the kingdom of darkness what God is doing next. Verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and what? Access with confidence by the faith that is of God. So the access is not an issue. It's not that God needs to make a decision. The decision's already made. It's not that God needs to do something else. He's already finished it. The will of God is done in heaven. It's not about, I need to get a new revelation because I don't know. It's about, you do know. God did reveal to you. You have the inside track on that which God is manifesting. And you are supernaturally endowed with access both to the throne of God and to know what God is speaking and doing and access to everything that objects to him because you're placed on a core directive of being the voice of God. What a day to be alive. So today we're going to unquestionably establish that God has given you access into the greatest revelation and life that anyone could ever live on God's earth. 
You live in God's presence without any sense of guilt, shame, even the knowledge of sin. This is where you live. You live where people can do anything and you hold them accountable for nothing. We live in a plane that has nothing held to the account of a person and grace abounding toward them in every decision path and all thought. Everything is within your reach as you live through him. Everything. Everything is within your reach. No one is out of your reach and nothing is out of your reach. But how many objections do we have to that in our mind? How many times do we hear, yeah, but, but look what I'm going through. But look what I've experienced. Hey, I've tried that. And I have basic statements about butts. All butts are goats. And all triers are liars. So if I say I've tried that, and I found God not faithful, then I lie. Because God can't lie. It's impossible for God to lie. So I can't say it's based on my experience. It's based on a God experience. My experience may not be the God experience, but it doesn't mean God doesn't have the experience for me to have from him. If my experience has not manifested God, then what experience will? And that's where we're going today. So that your eyes are open to the unseen realm of the spiritual world. We, we live in such an un, unbelievable dynamic of the spirit. So that everything that is seen is not made of things that do appear. Everything that's ever seen in your life is not made of anything that is apparent in your life. So if everything that experiences in your natural world did not come from the natural world, how much if you could access the spiritual dynamic that is affecting people and atmospheres and involvements, and you had the kingdom of God in power, in you, in function, would you be able through the purpose to which Jesus Christ came, and for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might do one thing, destroy the works of the devil. And you're the instrument through whom God's going to use. So your access to that atmosphere is without limitation. It's without inhibition. It is supernaturally sent to be the voice that God has ordained to say to the kingdom of darkness, no, this is what God has spoken. And what God speaks through you, he manifests. How many know manifestation takes it out of the realm of belief? I don't have to believe things anymore once they're manifest. It's not about, what do I need hope for? What do I need belief for if it's manifest? So then people begin to shift from the apparent to the unseen and say, God, what you do manifested in the scene. Bring the evidence of it to bear so I can say, God has spoken, here's the proof. That's what we're called to. The spiritual influence is more real than any sensory reaction you have to the things you go through. Think about what I just said. The spiritual influence behind the apparent is far more influential than the results that you see. The results come after spiritual influence. How many will agree with me? If God heals you, healing is the product of God having already worked, right? So if your body responds in healing, then what is now manifested came from the unseen. Likewise, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing what? All that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So if sickness, disease, and oppression comes upon you, what's the origin of it? The kingdom of darkness. Oh, you might take natural remedy and ways in which you can rectify the physical ills and conflicts, but behind it is a spiritual influence that's assigned destruction. So do you have access to what's behind the scene? Do you have access? If you have access, then you have authority to change it. What if you could rearrange the spiritual atmosphere and bring to bear the nature and life of Christ in manifestation through you? That's what we're talking about. Access. Access is granted to us to experience his life. We're going to talk about his view and love of us first. 
if I don't see how God thinks first, I'll come away reading scripture with my perspective. And my thoughts are not his thoughts and my ways are not his ways. So I need to shift every truth, not from what I have experienced, but on what he says and how he is toward us. How many would agree with that? I mean, while we're yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So I must know that my actions did not stop God from reaching me. So therefore, as grace has been reached into your life through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you know that it doesn't matter what a person has done, no matter where they are or how far off course they are, we have confidence in the Lord touching them. That God will both do and they will do what's commanded of them. That the result will be God manifest himself. Well, let's take a look. The next thing we're going to look at is our access to God is granted for us to walk in him and he through us. And lastly, our access is to see and know the purpose of Jesus manifest through us to destroy the works of the enemy. So take a look over here with me to 1 John 4 verse 9. 1 John 4 verse 9, because I want you to recognize what you prayed. That a door of utterance would be opened, make known the mystery that had been hid in God from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest, and that I would make it manifest. That there's a direct connect to the nature of God and what you're hearing to manifest God. 1 John 4 verse 9, in this was what? Manifested. It's interesting because the scripture is so clear as to what is believed and what God manifests. It's not says in this was believed. It says in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might what? Now stop for a moment. We generally think the love of God was manifest that whoever should believe on Christ would be saved. But Paul and Peter and John and James and all the apostles also had a manifestation of God's love. And that it was evidence that God's love was manifest that we might do what? Live through him. So love of God is not just that he loves me in my miserable, dysfunctional state. It's that he's given me access to have life through him. So I might need to redefine love in a different dimension. I may need to understand that love takes another step beyond reaching me where I am. And that is love. But love is manifested that we might do what? Live through him. Live, what is it like to live through Christ? Not just believe in him. I was with people this last week in ministries and they said, you know, you're challenging me on some of the very fundamentals of my belief. I said, I'm not challenging you on anything you believe. I'm challenging you on what's manifested. I want to know what God has manifested in your life. Oh, I'll tell you, the mind went into like, I know how this thing works. I know how that thing works. I said, but how does God work? Oh. Might manifest through us. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, he, that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. We, we shared what that word propitiation means many times in the past several weeks. and It means having the wrath of God appeased against the sin rule and dominance has been in man so that there is a complete payment so that everything in the nature of God that would be in anger and wrath against the nature of God would be fully satisfied by the sacrifice of the blood of Christ. So... If the love of God is manifested that we should live through him and that the interpretation of that love is that he loved us first, not that we loved him first, but he loved us, and that he sent his son 
to remove from the Father every sense of anger and wrath against us. So love was first to the nature of his Father so that from God to you, there is no wrath. Love. If I talk about God loving me, I might have a mental perspective of some warm, fuzzy sense of being cuddled and coddled and told that it's okay, he's going to work it all out. But this kind of love is not that kind of love. This kind of love manifests because he's given me access to live through him. Because I would know that as far as my father and I are concerned, there is nothing that impedes my communion with him. Nothing I've said, nothing I've done, nowhere I could go, no action I could take could ever possibly turn God in a distractive nature against me. He's not turned to what I do. He's turned to what Jesus did. He faces what Jesus did so he doesn't see what I do. Think about it. So I'm going to interpret love on the basis that Jesus loved me to such a degree that his blood presented to the Father a complete purging and freedom from all judgment and wrath against my life. 1 John 4, verse 13, it says, And herein know we that we dwell in him, and he in us. How do we know we live through him? How do we know he lives through us? Because he's given us his spirit. So how do I know? I don't know because of any other agency but the spirit of God. Then he says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be Savior of who? The world. The evidence I have is not only did he love me and have the blood of Christ become a propitiation for my sin and expiate and remove all issue of sin and consciousness from my being, but he did it for all men everywhere. There is no possibility that God views man in the condition of their sin nature. He views man in the power of one sacrifice and the presentation of blood. So when God sees man, that blood is speaking on their behalf. And verse 15, and whosoever does confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God had toward us. I know and I what? Believe. How many of you believe that you are so loved of God that there is nothing in him that is accounted against you? How many of you believe that? Now, is there any difference between you and anyone else? So then do you have the right to ever hold anything against anybody. No. So there's nothing in this nature that has record of how it affects me. Nothing. Nothing in the record of his love toward me can give me right to record an action, an ill will, some destructive nature against me because it's, it's an illegal act. It's an act of the accuser of the brethren, the one that comes to remind of the nature of sin and the actions thereof versus the grace that God has poured out and the love that he has toward us because I know and I believe the love that God has toward me. Because God is love and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. So if I view anyone anywhere at any time with judgment, what happens? I step in, just like Jesus spoke to Peter, get thee behind me who? Satan, for you're an offense unto me. You seek after not the advantages of the kingdom of God, but the advantages of belong to man. So the moment that I identify something, some way, some issue, some directive, some perception, some involvement, contrary to what Jesus has done, I step out of that engagement of life and nature,
And I step into a whole new genre of functionality and script in life. How many think the enemy's got a plan? Oh, he's no dummy. He knows how to destroy you. He knows how to upset you. He knows how to put the right people in your way to get the most aggravation out of you. He knows it. He doesn't give you people that don't affect you. He gives you people that do affect you. And they're the very people you're called to love. It'd be easier if they were lovable. But love does not have the condition upon the person that's loved. It has the condition upon the one that loves. So the person that's being loved doesn't have to do anything. They just are the object of the love. And there's no requirement. There's no onus. There's no demand on their life. There's only love toward them because this is how it works. And I know and I believe the love that God has toward me. I, I know. And I am completely, absolutely, no matter what I've done, no matter how I've done it, even if it was yesterday, I know I can come boldly to the throne of grace, obtain mercy, find grace to help in time of need. I know that. How many of you know that? Then that must be the continuum of our perspective because without that, we're in another kingdom. And you can't operate in the kingdom of God from another kingdom's perspective. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So I cannot function in the kingdom of God's dynamic and manifestation if I'm operating in the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the what is in it for me. And I certainly can't operate in it if I'm operating in the kingdom of darkness. If accusation and ridicule and the sense of I'm hurt and look what they did and how I need to defend myself and come out of this with my life intact because I'm not going to let anybody ever mess with me. Oh, I know you. You're in the wrong kingdom. <laughs> it's simple. That kingdom always lives self-defensive. That kingdom always lives with every way possible to bring up everything it can to demean the other person. Well, that's all right. We're not in that kingdom anyway. And he goes on in verse 17, and herein is our love come to maturity, made perfect. Verse 17, 1 John 4, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now think about when God is going to separate the sheep from the goats. Separate the, the ideals of people who've lived for themselves, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable. And that separation and eternal damnation is executed. And we have boldness before the throne of God because as he is, so am I in this world. You say, the day of judgment? Yeah, because I didn't operate by it. Judgment belongs to the Lord. It's not up to me. I live in the grace and love that God has poured out upon humanity. And at the end of the day, when it comes to that wrath being revealed from heaven, of which, if you ever read the book of Revelation, it does occur, there is no shortcuts and there's no way around it. Then I am bold in that day of judgment because it's not about what I believe, it's about what I've experienced as he is. So am I in this world. Because I've had a life that has manifested the life of Christ. You can't record a self-defensive act. You can't find where I've set up the defense mechanism so that I would not allow anybody to touch me. You can't find it. Because as he was in this world, so am I in this world. I kept that which was given to me. And I know and I believe that that love triumphs. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. So we begin to say, okay, if I've got to walk in this dimension, it's going to cause some shift in my life. It's going to make me make some qualified decisions that I'm going to choose the way God is over the way anyone else is. I'm going to choose the way God is over any other agenda or objective or way in which I could transact and function in the earth. Because if I have access and I don't take the access, I don't use the access and I don't access, then what happens is I function in a different dimension. I operate the other by the flesh, or the kingdom of darkness. And it says, 
As he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18. There's no fear in love. Perfect love does what? Cast out fear. That's not a teaching. This is not a teaching in the Bible. This is an experience of love that anything that says, if you move in that overwhelming grace toward their life, man, they're going to get advantage. That's called fear. To think that God is going to become dysfunctional and something else is going to take precedent and rule is fear. To think that your life is out of the dynamic of the nature of God's intervention is fear. To think that somebody else has a say-so over your life is fear. To think that something else could bind you to such an effect that you have to become servant to their agenda and objective is fear. That perfect love is not a teaching. It's an experience. It casts out. It removes how much? All fear. Because I know what fear does. And it says, because fear has what? Torment. Torment. He that fears is not made perfect, is not complete, is not whole in love. And we love him simply because he first loved us. So I have access to love. How many have access to love? But that access to love is just not a mental position. It is a rock-solid, immovable stand that God has poured out his nature toward and through and in me. And I know and I believe the love that God has toward me. So I fear not what man could do to me. I have no fear of what something else could occur to take me on a different track or plan or pursuit. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Who could separate us from the love of God, right? So you got the picture. That's how God is to me. How many of you like how God is toward you? That's how he is. He is no other way. He doesn't have plan B just to whip you one or two times to get you into shape. He doesn't have plan B to say, you know, I told you so. He only has plan A. And that's all he's ever going to have towards your life. I love you. I've forgiven you. I've engaged my nature with you and you can walk in me. There's nothing that impedes you from experiencing my life. Nothing restrains you from my fellowship. Romans 3 verse 21. This is how God is to us. Before I'm going to talk about access, I want to know how God is toward me. Because if, if I'm going to walk into a room and the light's off, I might trip over something. But if I know what's in the room I'm going into, then it's going to be as I expected. This is what it's about. It's about knowing how God is toward us. Because if I know how God is toward me as I access him, then he is as he said he is. Because he's not going to be a liar. He doesn't deceive. Romans 3.21 it says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. It does not require man's adherence to stand in the right standing with God without inferiority or guilt like sin never had influence over our life. It's being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say faith in. It's the faith that God has imputed to each one of us. Our capacity of heart to know that I believe that he raised me together with him and I'm in his presence without inferiority or guilt like sin never existed. I know that because my heart believes resulting in right standing with God. It says even the righteousness of God which is by the faith of him of Christ Jesus unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, I have, I've listened to so many people talk about the Roman road and the, the different steps of the laws of faith. And they, they love to take out this scripture, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is talking about revealing how God is, not how man is. It says, being justified, verse 24, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 
The word justified means just as if I'd never sinned, being declared righteous before his throne freely by his what? Grace. So I'm going to access an atmosphere of complete favor. I'm going to access a place of liberation from all consciousness that sin and human activity is even known. It said, but God, whom God has set forth as a propitiation, there's that word again, through faith in his blood to declare the righteousness for the remission of sins that are past with the forbearance of God. So he sent forth his son to take the wrath of God out of the way so that we can have faith in the acknowledging of the blood of Jesus and we can declare this is how freedom walks. This is how it manifests. I met with some leaders in this last week and I asked them just about, are you righteous right now? And they were like, well, I can't say that. I thought, how can you not say that? How can you not say that? They said, well, I wouldn't want to be presumptuous. I said, to not say you're righteous is to deny the power of resurrection life and the blood of Jesus before his throne. They said, well, I still have things in my life I have to fix. I said, there's nothing you can fix about you. So stop trying to fix people with your words. We had an opportunity to have some conversations. Verse 25. To whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare whose righteousness? His righteousness. Not us doing it right, but him presenting us rightly before our Father. Because he took away everything that would be contrary to us. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. So it's not about me, it's about him. He is just. And because of his justice, he's a legal God. And there had to be legality to remove the nature of wrath against you. So he did it. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him the son to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the what? Righteousness of God in him. So I got the picture. I'm going to access the throne of God where there is nothing in him. There's no backdoor thought. There's no second plan. There, it doesn't exist. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21. And you that were sometimes alien and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present who? So why did Jesus present his blood on the mercy seat? It wasn't for him. It was for you. And in his presentation of appeasing that wrath, you are presented in resurrection. Holy, unblameable, unreprovable in the sight of God. So I got the picture. If ever... God's nature could find fault, identify sin, bring judgment upon it, and have any propensity to render to my life according to my acts. Jesus removed it from the nature of God. Jesus removed it from the nature of God. He didn't remove it from me. He removed it from him. Amen. Listen carefully. If I'm going to access the throne, I want to know how he is to me. Because he's not as I think. He is as Jesus has him. So what did Jesus do? Took everything, every way, at any time, anything that could ever be levied against me. And presented me. Here I am, me. Me. How many know you? No, I'm not talking about somebody you think has got it together. I'm talking about you. How many know you? How many get some squirrely weird thoughts? How many get some like, man, I'll tell you, I want to just show them, you know. How, how many of you get some, you know, <laughs> they're not going to do that to me. How, how, many of you, how many of you, anybody get those thoughts? How, how many ever get the thoughts of the past? 
And they come and they speak in the present and tell you the future is going to be like what you've been through. You ever get those thoughts? We're talking about you. We're not talking about just some fleeting thought. We're talking about what you entertain, how you perceive, how you function. And God says, you don't have to change. The issue's not you. The issue's my father. If I remove from God the father the nature of wrath and I appease it by my sacrifice and he values you more than the price paid for you, and he says, this is what I've been after all along. I want them who could not help themselves. I want them who sit in darkness and now they see a great light. I want them who were not searching after me who discovered me. I want them who are shocked with how awesome I am in their life. I want them to know that they are in my sight, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in my sight. I want the sinner that doesn't care about me to know there's been an act of love that has been presented to the Father that has shifted judgment off your life. I want those that are judged, condemned, ridiculed, accusing, and don't even believe. I want them to know they are in my sight holy, unblameable, unreprovable. I want them to know that grace has been poured out upon their life. I want them to know there is an awesome outpour of love that transforms them, that there's nothing that I have in judgment against them. And every day that they breathe, I am going to be in their life. I'm going to be speaking to their life. I'm going to be upon their life. I'm going to be bringing people up to their life. I'm going to do everything I can through the grace through me to reach them through the love of God. And all I want my church to know is how I am. I only want them to know how I am. I don't want them to know how they are. I want them to know how I am. Because when they come boldly to my throne, I want them to know what they get. I want them to know what they're going to have when they get me. They're not going to get what the world says. They're not going to get a news report. They're not going to get what people said and did and how it injured somebody. They're going to get a clean slate, a judgment-free identity, wholly unblameable, if I am going to access that nature, I want to know what it's like. Because I've heard people talk about him and he's not the way his word says. Hebrews 10. Because if God is how I've heard people talk, God changed his mind. He's not as his word says. Hebrews 10, 18. It says, having therefore, it says now, where remission of these is, there's what? No more offering for sin. Once there's been the washing, purging of sin, nothing else. You can't say sorry. You can't say I'll change. You can't say give me a few days. You can't say I'll make it up to you. Any thought whatsoever that perceives, believes, or identifies that any onus is on you to appease God for the sin acts of another is a lie. There's no more offering for sin. Nobody, nobody, nowhere, no one, and nowhere can they ever provide anything that would appease God. So I cannot look at a person and say, look what they are doing. Because God doesn't see it. I can't say, man, when they change, they're going to be awesome. Awesome is not their change. Awesome is God. Awesome is not when they get it together. Awesome is God in the acts towards them. That's awesome. And as I'm in alignment with God, listen to what it says I can do. Verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, what? Boldness. To enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new. Now how many of you know when new means every single time it's new. In other words, I cannot go to my father and bring what I'm going through. Listen. I don't go to God in prayer ever and tell him about my situation. Because my situation is the product of of either my actions or someone else's, which he has no record of. 
So why am I going there with a record that he's already espunged? Why am I going there with an act of a person that that's not how he is to them? Let's put it in perspective. If I come to the throne of God and I say, Father, I want you to remember this person. And I believe you. You know what they've been doing. You know how it's been. You know how it's hurt. You know what I. No. God says, no what? No when? No where? No who? No how? I don't know. I don't. What are you talking about? Have you come to the throne of deceit and deception? Have you come to the accuser of the brethren and he that vengeance and judgment is his? Have you come to the one that's out to seek after to destroy? Then you need to go to him and have your prayer because I don't answer your accusation. If I'm going to come boldly to the throne of grace and I'm going to come boldly through the veil of the flesh of Jesus through a new and a living way, then I cannot take any perspective of my humanity with me. I can only take how God is with me. Because I'm going to access God how he is, not what I'm going through. You say, oh, but the Bible says he can be touched with the feelings of your infirmities for in all ways he was tempted like you are, yet without sin. Oh, that little part, yet without sin, is not just a byword that's kind of stuck on. Because what happens when you go through temptations, trials, distresses? Count it all joy. Joy. I don't want to go through this. I don't enjoy this. I don't like what they're doing. I don't. Are you kidding me? This is not what I bought in for. This is not what I made a covenant in marriage for. This is not what I joined the church for. This is not what I signed on the job for. Have you ever had some things that were not exactly what you planned? So who cares? Does God rewrite the script of your life because you've gone through some acts of another person? Does God shift his nature because of your human experience? What does he expect you to do? Recognize you are coming to the one through whom there is no wrath. You're coming to the one through whom there is no judgment. You're coming through a new and a what? Living. Everybody say living. living. That means I'm going to approach my father experientially, not spiritually. Exper I'm going to experience a new embrace of grace through a new and a living way. Well, how do I go to him in a new and a living way? I've got to know how he is. I can't miss how he is. I can't think how other people have said he is. I can't approach him how I have experienced life. I must approach him how he is. Have you got the picture? All right, let's read it again. Having therefore, brethren, what? Boldness. To enter into where? We're not just talking about the outward fringes of the presence of God. We're talking about the heart of God's highest manifestation, the holiest of all. The place where the high priest had his foot tied with a, a rope in case he dropped dead there, no one else could die because they could drag him out. Who'd have a bell on him that if he fell over, at least we know he fell, because no one's going to approach there. But we come boldly there by a new and a living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a full heart of assurance of what? Now stop for a minute. It says if you're going to enter, you enter with your heart completely assured of what God has put expectation for. You don't bring what you've gone through. You bring what he did. You bring how he is. You bring how his life is set to manifest in your life. And having our hearts sprinkled from a what? Oh, you don't bring, you don't go to the throne of God having awareness of what's gone wrong. No. You don't go to his throne aware of how much sin has taken you down. 
I don't know where you're going to, but you're not going to the throne of grace with a consciousness of sin because he doesn't respond to it. Huh? But that's how I relate to God. It could be your relationship is on the wrong place. It could be you haven't been accessing the access door. The access door, it could be that's why the manifestations are so infrequent. It could be why you're not experiencing the life of God in supernatural demonstrative ways. There may be a reason here. And if I know how he is toward me, then I expect nothing other than how he is toward me. Does that make sense? So I'm not going to come reminding and remembering and perceiving and functioning under a consciousness of sin. I'm going to come acknowledging he has purged me from all that could ever possibly attach and attract me. Dead works. Consciousness of sin is freed. And I come boldly to the throne of grace. I come through a new and a living way through the veil of the flesh of Jesus. I declare, Father, I stand in your presence. Holy, unblameable, unreprovable in your sight. I acknowledge your love that has overwhelmed me and how you are toward me. Oh, my Father, I can come into the depths of the core of your person and there's only that which you have decided to lavish upon my life and the exceeding riches of your grace and your kindness toward me. I come before your throne, Father, having my conscience purged from all sense of evil. I only have consciousness of how you are how you are, and my body sprinkled with what? Pure water. Say, what does that mean? When the priest would come out from the laver after the sacrifice, he would come to the laver of washing, and the priest had to put on linen to go in to the inner court because he wasn't permitted to bring the acknowledgement of all of the sin into. He had to go in with fresh linen. He had to go in acknowledging everything that was in my life is now gone from my life. And I am in your presence fresh with a robe of righteousness encompassed about me. I'm in your presence and there's nothing that could ever possibly take me back to that nature that it accused me, nor even the sacrifice that paid for me. I am in the throne of God by the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. It's called a new and a living way. We can trust that he accomplished a perfect work with us in himself and that we are his masterpiece to display to the world his life. Here we are. That's how he is to me. That's how he is. Now, I want to access him. Now, how many of you know that's how he is to you? Now, I want you to settle this is how he is. If you have any other thought, get it out right now. Because we are going to access the living God and make manifest what he says. We're not going to access Doubt, unbelief, worry, fear, life situation, concerns, frustrations, disappointments. That's not what we access. As a matter of fact, that is so far removed from me, I have no consciousness of it. We're accessing how he is. How he is. So before I go to point number two in the message, I want you to settle how he is toward you. Settle it, because I don't want to take you in and you be left out because you have a different mindset of how he is. That's why it's so clear in Romans 12 that we must have our mind washed because if we don't, we can't prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We've got to be able to put the test and say, this is God. This is God manifested. We need to say, this is God, and I know that's not. And it's simple. So first, let's settle how he is toward you personally. 
His love toward you. There's no rejection. There's not an act of man that has been against your life that is accounted toward you. There's not a sin that you've ever spoken or acted upon that could ever possibly be accounted in the throne of God. For the blood of Jesus was first to the Father before it was to you. My God, I know how you are to me. Go ahead, just talk to him how he is to you. That you've been presented holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Go ahead, just talk to him. Just talk to him. Talk to him that he raised you. Talk to him that he's released you from every claim. You're not coming to the throne of God based on your income level, your financial situation, your condition of life. You're coming because you're a child. Holy God. You're coming as an offspring of the Most High God. You're coming as the apple, the desire, the passion of God to reveal his love in the earth. You're coming as the favored, the desired, the one in whom he's well pleased. I'm coming as the favored son. I'm coming as the delight of you, my Father. I'm coming as the joy of your life, just to call you my daddy. I'm coming freed from the spirit of bondage that would induce me to fear. <laughs> I'm coming acknowledging you're my daddy and you love me. I'm coming acknowledging you are so awesome and wonderful you have no record <laughs> of a past. I'm coming knowing, knowing you. Knowing and believing the love you have toward me. I'm coming because it's how I come to you. Through the veil of the flesh of Jesus. I come by way of sacrifice. That every law, every ordinance that's ever been written against me, you nailed to the cross and took it out of the way. I'm coming to you because you spoiled principalities and powers. You made a show of them openly. You triumphed over them. You loosed me from, you translated me from, you shifted me from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of your son. I'm coming to you, Father, because you are to me. He that has begotten me again unto a living expectation by the resurrection of Christ. <laughs> I'm coming to you, my God, because you are so awesome to me. Oh. I'm coming to you. You who has redeemed me. You who has sanctified me. You who has called me righteous. You. You. You, 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 you. you. I'm coming to you. Oh, you. I'm coming to you. I'm accessing how you are to me. How you are to your children. How you are to this world. I'm accessing you. Wait, wait. Oh. You. I'm accessing you. You, 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 you. You, you, you. I'm accessing you. <laughs> Oh, you who for the joy that was set before you endured the cross, despised the shame, is set down to the right hand of the throne of God. You who took all contradiction of sinners against yourself. So I'd never be wearied in my mind and faint. Nothing from this world could ever defeat me. I'm coming to you. You. <laughs> Who's made me more than a conqueror through you. Who loved me. Yes, I'm coming to you. How you are to me. To me. To me. <laughs> oh. I know. I believe the love you have toward me. My God. Come to you. Oh, that's the Alabama no Papa. Mando se le mono se que le mando se que monda she fue on the masa baba no gawe. God, I come to you acknowledging your awesome power that all things are held together by the word of your power. You who authored and all things hear your voice. You, I come to you. 
Who's given life? And that eternal. You. Oh, I come to you. I come to you. Now, how many of you know who you're going to here? Have you got the clear picture of who you're going to? I mean, don't, don't think you're going anywhere else. Because when I take you there, I want you to know where there is. Because there is not where you've been. There is where he is. There is where he is. Number two. It's a look into our access. God granted us to walk in him and he through us. It's access that God granted us for us to walk in him and he through us. It's not access that I come by. It's access he granted me. The access is not because of me. The access is totally on him. Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified, declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also, now listen carefully, we have what? Access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now stay right here for a minute. By whom we have access by faith into this what? Grace. What God lavishes upon us that we have no record of ever having merited or deserved. That only is the impetus and influence of his nature upon me. And he's given me the expectation. Now faith, the substance of things what? Hope for. The evidence of things what? So the faith is the expectancy, the evidence of grace poured. I come accessing with the expectancy of grace pouring. Grace flooding, grace abounding, grace supernaturally perusing, grace unrestricted, unrestrained, grace so overwhelming that none can retain and affect the grace that's poured out. Sin prevails, grace overtakes it. Man's attitude resists, grace overpowers it. I am standing in access of grace that is unquestionable in its presence and power. You say, well, oh, that's by faith. As if faith is a secondary thought. I'm going to teach on faith in the next month. It will be an eye-opener to you. Faith is not what you get to get from God. That's not what faith is. Faith is the nature of functionality God's put in you so he can give to you what he's ordained. So I'm accessing by what he's put expectation in my life, a grace that is flooding me, grace that is overwhelming me. That's my access point. So as I get this, it says, and rejoice in the what? Hope of the glory of God. What is the hope of the glory of God? Isn't Christ in you the hope of what? Glory, isn't that the revelation of Christ in you? So here I am accessing him, and I have grace abounding, and I have expectation from God for his demonstration. Hope of the glory of God is not me hoping God will do something. It is God's expectation that he can show forth out of my life. The hope is from him, not from me. Romans 5.8. Well, let's, let's go on to another sentence here. Verse 3. And not only this, but we glory 
We outshine in that life. We boast, we celebrate in tribulations. We go through everything once we've accessed everything in our life, knowing that tribulation works what? I just become so tenacious, obstructions and indifferences and conflicts only make me more anchored. As a matter of fact, the harder it gets, the more anchored I am. The more oppressive it is, the more joyful I become. The more controversial it is, the greater joy manifests in my life. I mean, what I have accessed, nothing from this world can stop. Because I know tribulation works what? An anchorage of intensity, persistence. And that persistence manifests what? Experience. Oh, I can say I watched him, I watched him, I watched him, I watched him, I've accessed him, now I watched him. Oh my God, do I have history. I've got history of every time, anyway, anything has ever come up against me. God has been the same to me every time, every way without fail. And every time tribulation occurred, I found myself more anchored in tenacious conviction because I know it works. Such an experience that God proves himself is true. Oh my, I don't have to convince myself to rejoice in tribulation. I only do rejoice in tribulation. I don't have to think about what do I do because of this, because I've accessed him and I can only do what he does in the presence of it. Oh, my father. Not only so, but hope makes not ashamed. That hope from God never makes you back up. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which he has given to us. When I have accessed that throne, when I've come boldly to that place through a new and a living way, I know in whom I have believed and his love so penetrates me. It rushes greedily out of my life influences every atmosphere and every person that comes in the wake and course of my life. Oh, oh my God. What I have accessed, no man can turn back. What I have accessed, nothing can turn off. He that I've accessed is an experience in my life that everyone gets to know. I told you I'd take you there. <laughs> Romans 5, 8. And God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But now... It's much more. Now that I'm justified by his blood, I'm saved from every influence of wrath to come. There's nothing in God that's ever against me. Oh, I operate in a supernatural abounding grace that prevails over all judgment. For if when we were enemies in our mind by wicked works, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled, are we saved by his life? I'm not accessing his life to save me. I have his life that is saving everything that's around me. That's manifesting in every atmosphere that I touch. And not only this, but we also joy through God, our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement, which is the reconciliation, the royal exchange. We have received the power to reconcile everything to God. Oh, I got it. When I access the throne of God, I am supernatural from God in the atmosphere of humanity because what I've accessed is not anything from this humanity. It's only what God has done through his resurrection of son. It's interesting when you look at the word access, what does it mean? The word itself means an open way of access that you know that you're accepted as you approach. One of the root words is a very interesting word. It means to lead by laying hold of someone and taking them to the point of the destination. That I'm going to access, but it's not me. It's God who seizes me and says, let's go together into this throne room of fellowship. Another way of how it communicates is found when a person comes as, how many of you ever been on a ship coming toward shore? And you look at the, 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 the city or the location that you're going, and the closer you get, it seems like you're not moving toward it, but it's moving toward you. That's how access is in God. This, 
Aramaic word is one that is joint in combination. That as you draw nigh unto God, he draws nigh unto you. That there is an engagement as you look toward him. As he has even the slightest inclining that you are coming boldly to his throne. He engages you and he says, now you and I are drawing in. You and I are experiencing together. You are accessing with me. You're not accessing by you. You are accessing with me. You're, you're not accessing by you. You're not coming by you. You've been seized by him. You've been possessed by him. You've been drawn in by him. And he says, I'm shifting everything that's contrary to me out of your mind. I'm removing everything you perceive out of your consciousness. I'm watching your heart. I'm washing your heart from an evil conscience by the blood of Jesus. And I've seized you. I'm drawing you with me into myself. Oh, I'm come as you have led me. I'm come as you made the way. You're the truth. You're the life. And you've come with independent, individual invitation that draws me with you. God, I engage your life. I access you. Access you. You. Now let's stand before him. I have a whole nother point, but we can't get to it today. I just want you to know where he sees you to go. What he has attracted you to. How he is toward you and how when you respond, he becomes so magnificent, so overwhelming, so supernatural. All he looks for is the little glint of your eye turning to him. And he's rushing to your presence saying, that's it. Come, you're mine. 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 I'm yours. I'm yours. You're mine. I'm yours. You're mine. I'm yours. Are mine. Go ahead. Access. 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 With boldness and confidence by the faith of Him. Access. God that I might make manifest as I ought to speak. Access. 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 You are power, you are wisdom, you are 
and righteous redemption and sanctification you are upon. You are love. You are forgiveness and power. You are strength and might. You are all to me. You are my security, my strength, my life. I come. You access. I draw near. You bring me in. You reveal yourself. I am in you. Oh, there's none like you. What's amazing is there's not any thought of any error or any